Hello everyone and welcome to today's recorded session titled 3D Printed Ceramic Dental Application. Insight into state of the art and future developments. My name is Isabel, I'm business development manager at Litoz and the moderators for today's recorded webinar. Uh, before we dive into the topics, I would like to give you a couple of practical information. Uh, we would love to hear from you, share with us all your questions by contacting the speakers directly at uh, Daniel Bombs at, uh, his, on his email address and uh, Dr. Jens Tarsch. So ceramic materials are already widely used in the dental industry as they are biocompatible and have less of a risk of causing inflammation compared to metal implants. Ceramics also have the benefit of having long-term stability and high mechanical performance, which is ideal for implants that have to perform the function of teeth. 3D printing is already an established technology for numerous applications, and now 3D printing of ceramics is also being introduced in the field of dentistry. It is a digital manufacturing technology that offers a greater degree of design freedom compared to conventionally produced devices. On July 3rd, Litoz announced entering in cooperation with Dr. Tash, and I hope we will learn more about this alliance and its aims today. I'd like to introduce you now to today's presenters, uh, Dr. Jens Tarsch and Dr. Daniel Bomze. Um, Daniel Bomze serves as the head of medical business unit for Litoz, where he's responsible for strategic market development and providing digital manufacturing solutions to customers in the medical and dental market. Daniel has a chemistry background and broad experience in materials research. Daniel possesses more than three years of experience in AM for the medical industry and he's author of numerous applications and patents. Welcome, Daniel. Dr. Jens Tarsch is a well-known expert for ceramic implantology. He graduated in 1992 at the Free University of Berlin in Germany and today is working in his private dental clinic in Zurich in Switzerland. His main emphasis is in ceramic implants and biomaterials in dentistry and is an international educator, speaker and author in his field. Last but not least, he's the founder and president of the European Society for Ceramic Implantology. Welcome to you, Jens. Um, Daniel will start today. Um, he will give us some insights on state of the art of ceramic materials for 3D printing and ideas on how the technology is used to develop innovative applications in dental field as well as medical. Daniel, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, Isabel, for the kind introduction and uh, welcome everybody to the, our today's webinar. Um, I'm happy to present you today a bit about our uh, technology. So first of all, a bit about uh, the company Litos. Uh, we see us as your partner in ceramic 3D printing. And within the last years, we have evolved uh, to the world's market and innovation leader for ceramic 3D printing. Our product portfolio comprises of 3D printers, the materials, so the ceramic suspensions, the software to control the printers and all kinds of customized solution may be on the side of hardware, software, or even material solutions. Our company uh, is based in Vienna in Austria uh, with the headquarter and has a subsidiary in Troy in the state of New York in the US. Currently we have more than 70 employees and are rapidly growing. And uh, we have so far installed more than 70 uh, 3D printers for high performance ceramics worldwide. And at least 25% of our customers have two or more machines with one of our customers already having six machines in the serial production of medical devices. So what about the LCM technology? LCM stands for lithography-based ceramic manufacturing. And uh, as already announced is a 3D, 3D printing technology for all kinds of ceramic materials. So the process chain itself uh, comprises of the designing process that can be a scan from a patient, it can be a design from a CAD software and always has to be in the end in the STL format, which gets transferred to the, to the printer itself. Then the 3D printer is, con the 3D print is conducted 
Then what we get out of it is a so-called green body, which is a composite of a ceramic material and the photopolymer, which, that, which uh, is used as a binder and structure giver here. And we have to do the thermal post-processing, which uh, is part of, or of which debinding and sintering are part. So debinding means burning out of the binder and sintering is then the consolidation of the ceramic particles until we end up with the final product. So how does that work in detail? Basically, we're using here the principle of wet photopolymerization. So we have a three-dimensional CAT model. This model is virtually sliced into two-dimensional images. And each of those images is then projected by a DLP system, so digital light processing uh, or mask projecting on a photosensitive formulation. What you can see here on the right side is we have a light source at the bottom, then the mask here, and, the, and then the light is here projected on this photosensitive formulation, which is here depicted in white. And where there's no light, uh, this part is depicted in gray. Important to understand is where the light hits this formulation, this formulation will solidify, and where there is no light, the formulation will stay liquid. This is now done over and over again, and therefore a three-dimensional body is created. How does this work in, in detail here? We have here on the left side a photograph of the inner part of the machine of the building room, and on the right side we have a scheme. What you can see here, numbered with one, is the so-called building platform. We see here on the left side, it's this uh, black uh, cuboid, and we have here the parts that are already partly being printed. They're hanging here from the building platform. Two is the vat, which holds the material and which has a transparent bottom. You see it here on the left side, this round thing uh, with the white material inside. Um, and from below, four is the LED light source and three is the optical system, which comprises of millions of tiny mirrors, which can be turn on or off basically, and therefore are generating these uh, layer information. So these two dimensional images, which come from the three dimensional uh, model. So the light goes from below through the transparent bottom of this vat in the material and cure the material uh, where it should be on the bottom of these parts. And after each layer, the vat is turned around below this viper blade so that the material is uh, homogeneously distributed again. And this is now done over and over for several hundreds of thousands of layers until the, uh, the print job is done. After that, I already mentioned that we have to do the binding and sintering because what we get out of the print directly is, is only a composite material, not a pure ceramics. So we have a photopolymer here de depicted with these tiny little gray bubbles and the ceramic particles, which are here, this yellow, uh, bubbles in the in the middle, and they are this three-dimensional body here on the image of our CEO, Dr. Johannes Homer. Uh, after debinding, which basically is here a burning out, a pluralization of the organic photopolymer, uh, we have a bit of a shrinkage here, and we end up with the so-called white body with already sinter bridges between the particles. And if we now heat the material further up to the sintering temperature, which can be depending on the material, between 1,200 and 1,800 degrees Celsius. Uh, we, get, we end up with complete consolidation and densification of the parts so that we end up with the final dimensions and the final ceramic properties. So I want to emphasize here, in the end of our process, what comes out is a pure ceramic part, for example, a crown, a dental implant, or any other kind of implant. So there is no polymer left. So, about the printers itself, uh, we offer here a rather big uh, product portfolio. We started back uh, in the beginning of our company with our state of the art product, the uh, Seraphab 7500, which you can see here on the left side, which is a really stable and reliable uh, product for additive manufacturing or so-called 3D printing of ceramics. At the beginning of 2019, we started going into the dental market and we launched this uh, Seraphab 7500 in the dental configuration, uh, which has some special configurations uh, in hardware and software in order to uh, um, fulfill the requirements from the dental market. 
And uh, last year at the Form Next Fair, we launched the Seraphop System series, uh, comprising of the Seraphop System S25, Seraphop System S65, and Seraphop System S230. Uh, as you can see here, the resolution uh, depends on the um, projecting system that we are using for the machines and is between 25 and 75 microns in X and Y. And in the sets direction, we can adjust it between 10 and 150 micron micrometers. That will end up in a different building volumes. Uh, we have building volumes between 76 times 43 millimeters uh, up to 192 times 120 millimeters and so a maximum height of 500 millimeters. Regard uh, of building speed, uh, we say we can build up up to 150 uh, layers per hour. That means, for example, with a layer height of 100 microns, we end up with 1.5 centimeters per hour in buildup. And because it's a mask projecting uh, a DLP process here, it does not influence the, build, uh, the printing time if we have one part on the building platform or if the complete building platform is filled with parts. So in terms of productivity, of course, you want to use as much space as possible. So what kind of materials can we process here? Uh, we have here also a rather big material portfolio, starting from the classical high performance ceramics like alumina, so which is aluminum oxide, zirconia, which is zirconium oxide, combinations of those, of, of those both like um, aluminum, aluminum toughened zirconia or zirconia toughened alumina, uh, porcelain, for example, glass ceramics, thinking of lithium disilicate, but also resolvable materials like bioactive glasses, hydroxyapatite, tricalcium phosphate, and also non-oxide ceramics like the very interesting silicon nitride here. For the technical parts, uh, also magnesia, corderite are very interesting materials. Of course, silica-based casting core uh, for investment casting applications and really special applications then like piezo ceramics and uh, moon dusts, for example. So, what properties can we achieve with these kind of materials? I think it's very important to understand here that the results that we get here with additive manufacturing, so called 3D printing, are the same that you already know from conventional manufacturing processes, for example, like pressing or milling or uh, injection molding. So uh, we have here a strength, for example, for alumina of 430 megapascals, a density over 99.4% of the theoretical density. And what I think is really also an, a game changer here is that we have a very, very smooth surface, a very good surface roughness of only 1.4 micro, for example, for alumina. And the same is also true for zirconia and for example, silicon nitride here. I think this is also really very interesting uh, properties here that can be used in medical and industrial applications, of course. So I think something that really shows what the quality of the parts that you can achieve here is if you have a close look at the microstructure uh, of aluminum oxide, for example, here, or also at the final part, you have here a, a small um, slide of aluminum oxide, which is almost a millimeter thick. What you can see here is you can completely read through it. So it was it was hipped so that it's really translucent. You have here very uh, regular and uh, good distributed and, and similar shaped uh, grains in the microstructure, um, almost no pores. And that leads to this very good optical properties here. And I think this is really something that is uh, that is a difference compared also to competitors and to other manufacturing techniques. And therefore, I'm very happy to show also these results here. What about medical applications? Uh, here I want to show you some solutions and success stories and things that can be achieved with the LCM technology. First of all, I think one of the main applications of additive manufacturing is aluminum uh, or is, is lattice, all kind of three-dimensional lattices. What you uh, see here on the left side is a lattice cylinder made out of alumina. And on the right side, you see here the, the microscopic image. You see here that the strut size is between 55 and 85 micrometers, where the hole is, be, uh, is around 100 micrometers. So I want to, again, remind you, the hole is like that of a human hair. 
And that is, I think, really shows also the high resolution and the higher producibility of this kind of technology that we can here achieve. Another very important application is a bone replacement with bioresorbable kinds of ceramics. It can be for small and large bone defect, even critical sized. We can use here bioresorbable tricalcium phosphate, which is also known as TCP, hydroxyapatite, which is basically the inorganic fraction or the mineral fraction of the, of the human bone and all kinds of bioactive glasses. And what can be achieved here is an open and interconnected pore network, which allows the ingrowth of blood vessels and a good uh, supply with nutrition and oxygen of the ingrowing cells. And of course, also perfect, perfect patient fit because the, the parts are made uh, based on the uh, imaging data of patients. So this is basically a unique solution for every patient and every kind of defect here. Also, uh, non-resolvable but permanent implants, higher du durable implants like this mandibular joint replacement. This, for example, was created within a research project and was generated directly from computed tomography data, uh, yielding a very, very smooth surface, which was then additionally polished in order to give the very best results uh, with a material here with a very high wear resistance and a very good compatibility. And in the end, it was even glued together with titanium and showing a very, very good mechanical behavior here. But you can co combine those properties, the best of both worlds. In and we showed that here uh, in the case of this jawbone implant, of this mandibular implant, we have here this cage. And the outside of the cage is made of zirconium dioxide or zirconia. The inside here is hydroxyapatite. And the aim here was to create an implant that on the outside give proper support for the both healing ends of this bone and the inside uh, giving a good osteoconductive material, which allows the ingrowth of the blood cells again and uh, gradual resorption of the material by the bone cells and replacement by native tissue. So therefore you have the proper stabilization in the healing phase on the one hand and the good osteoconductive properties of the hydroxyapatite, uh, which in the end eventually will be completely replaced by new healthy tissue. And in the end, there is even some place where you can put then dental implants so that you can again achieve the chewing capabilities. But also dental restorations, for example, crowns, bridges, veneers can be produced with the LCM technology they are featured here by really finest edges that can be accomplished down to 100 microns, very sharp fissures. You don't need any kind of polishing in the end because the surface properties is already so good and you can use all the kind of standard staining and semantic technologies that you already know from conventional um, manufacturing techniques like milling. One very important topic from today is of course the dental implants. What we show here is that dental implants can be produced from different kinds of materials. For example, zirconia, alumina, silicon nitride, with a great design freedom. As you can see here, for example, we can print inner ISO M2 threads, which is usually not so easy to mill, and we can just print it in the, in the part. The surface can be tailored. So for example, you have here a uh, zirconia surface and here a silicon nitride surface with these very nice nano roughness of these beta silicon nitride um, crystals here on, on the surface. And of course, it's highly productive. So what does highly productive mean? What machine capability do we have here? How many parts can we manufacture? So we took here a, a bit of an example calculation. The height of the implant here is 17 millimeters. We used a TZPA, so a, a tetragonal uh, stabilized zirconium polycrystal um, with, uh, which is part of our Litocon uh, 3 wide 210. And um, what we did here is a calculations for either one serifepsis system, S65, or a combination of four. And with this combination of four, you end up with a billing time per implant of 0.5 minutes, so 30 seconds for an implant. And we can print up to 660,000 implants per year. I mean, that is really something I would call a highly productive manufacturing technique. 
So with that, I'm at the end of my presentation and we are really committed to your vision of innovation. And therefore we have here this great collaboration with Dr. Jens Tarch from the, the president of the, of the SC. Um, because we want to be here a partner. Litos, as a supplier of the manufacturing technology of the material, Dr. Jens Targe, with a lot of experience in the field of um, the implantology, and of course, somebody like you, and hopefully it will be you very soon, uh, who is really manufacturing those implants or whatever application you have in mind, and we will be happy to work here together with you in order to get here a good product and in order to start here a very um, reliable and uh, prosperous uh, collaboration. With that, I want to thank you for your kind attention and I want to give back to my colleague Isabel. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm always very fascinated by the developments pushed forward by, by your team. Um, so if you have any questions for, for Dr. Bomze, just feel free to contact him, um, as I'm sure David, uh, Daniel will be happy to hear from you. Okay. Um, so Dr. Taj um, will now present us uh, reasons for the use of ceramics in implantology um, and share his view on the use of uh, 3D printing in dentistry. Um, so Jens, are you ready to jump in? Yes, I'm ready, let's jump. <laughs> Isabel, thank you for your warm introduction and uh, Daniel, thank you also. And thank you to Litos for the opportunity to give you a short, because of the so short time slot, a short insight into ceramic dental implants and certainly into the huge development of the Litosh additive manufacturing systems. I have to consider in advance, and that is what we hear often and mostly as an introduction, but it's, but it's clear and it's true, though titanium still is the gold standard worldwide in dental implantology because we have very good and high survival rates. We have everything what we need for a successful surgery for long term for our patient from the aesthetic, the biocompatibility, the osseointegration, integration. So everything we need, maybe we have is titanium. And then the question is near why we should think about ceramic implants and why is Litush uh, involved in all these new technologies and developments? What is the background of all of that? And maybe it's just a trend. So we see it in a lot of congresses and uh, also the analysts are predicting a market increase up to 10% in the next five years. And this trend is also carried by our patients in our office because they change a little bit the mind and the healthy uh, thinking. And it has to be no more metal, it has to be white. What's with aesthetic and maybe holistic consideration could play a role. But finally, the reputation and it's, it's with us as a dentist, we have to place the right indication for that. And uh, following that, if you ask a dentist, still the titanium implant is because of the reason I told you already is in the middle of, of, of the working area. But it's starting a little bit to change because they are also uh, starting to discover the clinical advantages maybe from the ceramic dental implants. And if you will do that and, we, and the patient is not involved in the decision, the question is, what is the rationale in choosing the one or the other solution? And, we want, and if you want to answer this question, we have to compare peers with peers and apples with apples. Because also titanium is not without problems. And this is also clinical reality. The high prevalence of the peri-implantitis, the inflammation around uh, titanium implants, for example, here, we have a great study from Dirks from Sweden with nine years and the prevalence around about 15% or 20% during five to 10 years after implant placement. And if you think we are talking about 10 million implants inserted per year, that's a big number we have to deal with. So, yeah, the question is, do we have maybe less peri-implantitis with the ceramic implants? And I cannot tell you or show you every study and every fact we have. Only here, just a very great 
uh, research from my friend Stefan Röhling from Munich. So they placed in uh, San Antonio, Stephen Cotron, they placed the uh, titanium and uh, zirconia implants in the dog jaw. And um, after a time, after 12 weeks, they induced an artificial inflammation, an artificial peri-implantitis. And after that, they measured what happens. And here you see the implants, titanium and the zirconia implants in the bone after the healing. And then after the artificial inflammation, you see the defects here also with the zirconia implants. They measured the defects, but they found statistically significant less peri-implant bone loss compared to titanium with zirconia implants. And uh, this is also what we see in our, in our clinics. One of the biggest arguments, especially from the manufacturers and also in the marketing area, is certainly the white material. Do we have a better aesthetics, maybe with uh, ceramic implants? And these are cases out of my office. You see here is titanium implants. You see the gray shining through here in the tissue around titanium implants. That's not in every case, but it happens. And we can manage it. Maybe it's depending a little bit about the surgery technique, this mucograft, you can figure the tissue, but it happens. And this show also Ronnie Jung from the University in Zurich. They measured the uh, titanium plates, the uh, veneer, zirconia plates, they placed it under the skin of a big jaw here and made a spectral photometric evaluation. And they found, yes, both the shining through but titanium gray up to two millimeter tissue thickness and zirconia only 1.5 millimeter, but then white. And this is a visible difference also in speaking distance to a patient. And also that happens. We see here in the middle, the small recessions with uh, titanium implants. And maybe we see also the recessions with zirconia implants, but we can see it as a dentist, the white ones, but a patient sees only the, the black ones and they, this is not what you want, especially with a gummy smile, but the white one the patient normally doesn't see. So maybe we have here some small advantages with the zirconia implant. We can manage it also the aesthetic with zirconia implants definitely, but the way is maybe a little bit harder than with the zirconia implant. And connected with aesthetic, certainly the question, do we have better soft tissue? And healthier soft tissue is connected with inflammation, with plaque accumulation, and also Stefan Rulling compared here the plaque amylocation around titanium and zirconia. So the, he placed the human biofilm, human bacteria on a titanium plate and on a zirconia plate. And then after 72 hours, he measured it and he found a lot of more total mass on a titanium surface than on a zirconia surface, but also the thickness of the biofilm has been thicker on a titanium than on a zirconia surface. And also the blood circulation is a part of house mass and a healthy tissue. And this uh, as was Kachivari did, he measured the blood circulation around uh, natural tools, around the zirconia abutment and around um, titanium abutment. This is amazing what he found. So a uh, zirconia abutment can be compared in the blood circulation nearly to a natural tooth. And he found that uh, titanium abutment is up to 18% less than a um, uh, zirconia abutment. And you know, blood circulation is health. And health, it looks like that. And this is my final reason or my main reason for using zirconia implants because we often, we found these nice uh, non-inflammatory tissue. And now you can say, yes, it's the best picture he showed in his lecture. And I can tell you, it's not the fact, it's in every case the same. And uh, this is really amazing what we can achieve here with the uh, zirconia implants. And we have less plaque, we have less inflammation, better blood circulation, and uh, no corrosion or foreign body reaction around these kind of implants. And that is the reason why we can use it here is for some easier case may, maybe, but also for complex cases in this aesthetic area. And this is a long-term stability in this, uh, this aesthetic way. So we can consider we have less, maybe less uh, perimplantitis, better aesthetic, better soft tissue. And for that, we have already preclinical data. 
And this is what we can confirm by our clinical observation. And we have the promising short and midterm results for that. But certainly we need a long-term scientific evidence that must follow and uh, we have to confirm that. But we can already today say that the times of the dinosaurs are over. This bad rate of interpretation with a low success, this is passed with a long, with the one piece implants with the aluminum oxide ceramics and all these materials. So today we're living in a renaissance of ceramic implants. The outcome is near titanium implants. And because we had a really a strong generation shift and uh, more technology, technology development by material surface design and uh, different protocols. But patient safety is the most important aspect. And we have requirements for the dental implants. And uh, for that, we need a scientific research, especially in regards to the materials. And this is what we see for titanium implants. And this we have to prove certainly in the same range and an eye level with uh, ceramic implants. And let's see what happened here. For example, we need evidence for that. And uh, here's Stefan Mühling. He did a great meta-analysis. So he compared co already, not anymore commercial available implants with uh, commercially available uh, ceramic implants. And he compared the outcome, the survival rates. And uh, you see it changed a lot. Here is one year, 89.3% uh, uh, for one year. And uh, we already have studies from Warren Young, for example, this 98.5% uh, outcome survival rate uh, for five years. And this is a range of titanium implants. And also the fractures, the fracture rate decreased within the last 10 years from 3.4 to 0.2%. And these are really evidence we have, and uh, these are facts so we can recommend it to our patients. If we have the right stability in these kind of implants. And every one of you knows zirconia is not equal to zirconia, it is depending these material properties, mainly about the manufacturing process. So you see here a homogeneous defect-free zirconia surface with a uh, flexible range from 1,100 MPa. On the other hand, so you see the defects inside and it's going down on the half, so with 500 MPa. So I think that's a lot, especially for, for the clinical use. And it's depending about the manufacturing and here we have mainly two big different uh, ways to go. First, the uh, injection molding or the green body working. So first we have shaping, we create the form by milling or by molding, and then the refinements, the sintering by the hip prostates, the yeah, hot isotetic uh, post-compaction to um, become um, refined, refined material. On the other hand, we have the hard machining. So here we have first the help on the refinement and after that, um, the milling out of the refined blank. Here we get to really a high uh, precision and high accuracy speed with that. And maybe we have now the third option for the future of the RCM technology, the additive manufacturing. And this is a very interesting way to add that. And we can build up or we can produce the implants in all of these three um, manufacturing processes. And yeah, we have to add, this is just a design study. We have to go deeper in research and to improve materials. But you see what's possible and uh, there are a lot of options and possibilities. But which material properties we can achieve or what do we have, what do we need in the moment? So here for our restoration, for our crowns, for example, you see, depending on the transparency from 600 to 1000 MPa, the flexural strength. And uh, the actual, the modern implants have this uh, YTCP or TCPA, 1100, 1200 MPa. That is a uh, state of the art. And we have a new kind of implants from ATZ, alumina toughened zirconia. And it's depending about the manufacturers, so then uh, depending about the prospects, what's coming between 1,400 round to 2,000 MPa, for example. 
And we have with the 3D additive manufacturing with the little cone you've heard from Daniel, 930 megapascal. But if I compare as a dentist, my question is always, how's the measurement? Three point, two point, how was the, the pressing? It was only axial, isostatic. Is it hipped or not? And I think this is the line, this is the range we have to achieve. And also here with, uh, with the additive manufacturing, we have to come up a little bit in this area, but we have to consider these 930 MPa are not hipped. And we have to see in Daniel what happened if we have the hip material and we go deeper in measurement. But this is just the material properties. And the question for dentists is what happened in real life? What is the long term? What happened with the um, implant itself? So we have a different implant geometry and uh, how was the long term load? This we can measure in the eyes of 4081, for example, the fatigue trench. Here's a small implant and uh, 37 degrees water here and uh, two times per second with a lever arm here on these small implants. And this has to work for a minimum two, my, two million cycles. So this is a little bit around eight years, fatigue strands, eight years working. And you see the results are not really different in the moment. The ATS, ATZ2 uh, screw retained, the TCPA monotype implant, and also here the titanium screwed in the same range. For me, it's not interesting, it's exactly a uh, value, but um, I see I can compare and I can use it in this way for my patients. On the other hand, we have to measure the fractal strength, depending also on the geometry of the implant, of the design of the implant. And here, a study from Tim Yoda compared uh, TCPA and the uh, ATZ, for example, um, two piece, one piece in place, always in the same range. And you see the implant here in the middle, and um, the power, the force was increased up to the fracture, and this is measured. And you see here the time uh, the, the power is increased, and then the fracture point goes down, and here is a small implant. Same as Benedict Spies from uh, University in Freiburg in a moment. He compared it to a titanium and zirconia and after aging, for example. And also he found more than 1,100 Newton in this fracture strange. And he considered the elevated ADZ implant system will withstand long-term physical master curry forces. So also an argument to recommend and to use it for my patient. But now you see, we have two studies. We have the same ISO 4081, but we have here 720 Newton and here 1,100 Newton in the same ISO testing. And the different was the embedding material, the bone was different. So for us, it's important for us dentists to, to compare the um, implant and the material and all these values for that. So we need a standardized and optimized testing methods. That is a very important point thing for the future. But the um, implant has also to work. And um, this we measure with the bone implant contact, the big, it means does an implant work? How big is the contact between the implant and the bone itself? And you see in former days here with titanium implant, the smooth machine surfaces only around about 20% bone implant contact. It was to last, so when I uh, added the sand blasting, then you came up a little bit to 35% of the bone implant contact. And then today we have an additional acid aging. Here, for example, in this uh, SLA surface in titanium, we come around about 60% of the bone implant contact. And that is, that is what we need. And this is the state of the art in titanium today. And the roughness for that should be around about one to five micromillimeters for that. And these are titanium surfaces. Thank you to Peter Stilschippach for these uh, fantastic, amazing pictures of the titanium here is an FLA surface. And here, for example, a different titanium to titanite surface. And uh, it's amazing what, what happened here. But we compare these titanium implants in the animal studies. We see always a range around about 60% bone implant contact, depending on the different uh, way of the study. And um, this has to be simulated also now with uh, uh, ceramic implants. Also here you see 
ceramic implant surfaces, sandblasted and acid etched for the microstructure here in this way or here, or an additional laser modified or an additively coated surface of a ceramic implant. And with this kind of modern surface topography, we can reach and achieve nearly the same bone implant contact with titanium. And we can see, yes, we have also the same osseo integration. In that. But if we treat with sandblasting, with acid etching, if we treat the surface of this uh, zirconia implant, everyone knows, yeah, maybe we bring the energy inside the material and we can start a phase transformation for and uh, transformation to the, from the tetragonal to the monoclinic, not so stable phase for that. So we weak a little bit this material. And one way would be here with a, a ceramic molding with a sim, because maybe the surface is here directly inside the form of the implant. So we have not to touch it. It's always the challenge to get the right balance between the roughness we need and uh, avoiding the phase transformation. So the surface treatment, no surface treatment, uh, to find it, to create the right surface for the right big and the right also integration. And this, uh, for this, I see a big opportunity and a possible new approach for the future in the 3D printing and the additive manufacturing. So uh, we heard from Daniel re printing resolution from 25 to 75 micron. Um, it's not a pet and we can uh, improve it more and more. And finally, we have to use it. We have to handle this kind of implant. And uh, we have a lot of different shapes and uh, concepts, mainly the one piece implants, and maybe on the other hand, the two piece, mainly the screw retained, the glued implants going a little bit back. The development is not big in that because the tendency is more to the screw retained. And let's have a small look inside these concepts. So with a one-piece monoblock implant, it's easy to produce, certainly. We have no abutment, we have no micro gap, it's hermetic close, and it's what we do. We make um, place an implant, make an impression, and we cement the crown as we are usually do it in, in dentistry with some natural teeth. For that, it's the longest type of implants we have, so we have a better, we have a good evidence behind that. But on the other hand, we have we can't change it. So we have to place it in the right position. It has to be uh, placed really exactly inside the bone. And uh, it's not flexible, it's not reversible. So we can change concepts. Uh, this is kind of implants. On the other hand, the two-piece implants, the screw-retained implants with the right range of uh, indications. We can use it like uh, our titanium implants. But it's a new development, it's a new technology, so we have less evidence behind that. But this is a gold standard in titanium also, so it's reversible, it's flexible, we can work with that how we are using. But the big question is, how can we connect the hard ceramic abutment with a hard the ceramic implant? And it's not so easy because if you see here the interface of a titanium implant, this is screw and the screw connection in this interface, this is really inside the implant, and this has to be created when we try it also with uh, ceramic implants. And here you see different concepts of these, uh, this is screws or this doing here. And um, this is internal interface connection between abutment and implant. But everything we do inside, always the question, do we initiate maybe a micro crack and a, a phase transformation by working and by doing inside the implant. And um, yeah, also that could be a big option for um, the additive manufacturing in the future. You heard from Daniel all the ISO M2 threads inside producing, but no, we are don't touching the, insert, the, the interface inside the implant. Yeah, but we are talking about humans and we are talking about dental implants, we are inserting it in the bodies of our patient and we are inserting real implants and not computer data. So we have really a demand for highest quality. So this only can be guaranteed with a coordinated material, with a right design, with a 3 three printers, with process and with research in the back and after producing with the individual testing. It's a medical device 
and there's a medical device, it's fixed in the body. So it's not reversible and we are responsible for that and we have not to go for compromises, compromises for that. And concerning or regarding the implants, yeah, we need further development, we need uh, improved processes and scientific research. On the other hand, we have the abutments in a two-piece implant, and this is removable, it's reversible. And here we have a lot of option in the shape and in producing it. And this could be a good option because sometimes we need individual situations like here. This patient came to me with a wrong placed implant in this uh, curious position and um, with a standard abutment, it was not resolvable. And in this case, we produced an individual highly angulated abutment by CAPCAM to um, restore and restore and uh, to save this case. And uh, that is the reason, and this is the main area in the moment today for me where I can see this customized additive manufacturing of these uh, abutments. Concerning the restoration, it's also removable in the patient's body and we have a high aesthetic requirement, but this is uh, standing in the highest competition at the moment with the CAPCAM system. There's a lot of different materials with technologies in the digital workflow, but um, we see also here, uh, Litosh is uh, working on it and we have the first studies from the group from Munich here, for example, it can be shown that the RCM technology is possible to manufacture highly accurate parts with exceptional good surface quality. And I think there's a lot of uh, good options for the future. And also here the group uh, from Zurich with Alexis Ioannidis, Ioannidis with the Oclosal veneers. And you see also we found a, nearly the same hardness with the uh, CAPCAM veneers, for example. And uh, there's a lot of things we can use for the future. But finally, finally, if we have new technologies, I think they have to come in the same jumping high as the already proven system. That is the reason when we can use it. And it makes no sense to go here for compromise. This is my personal option and we need the same requirements. So uh, depending TCP 80 set, 1200 to 1400 MPA in the flexural strength in the four point measurement, and the static loading, 1,100 Newton as minimum, dynamic loading, 350 Newton with 2 million cycles. And we should achieve a micro rough surface between an SA1 and 2 micrometer without additional surface treatment. This is my wish for the future. This is my wish for uh, additional manufacturing from Litos. And then we can say, yes, it's a high innovative and highly interesting new concept for producing ceramic implants in the future, because we have really the option for new designs and new shapes and new uh, production processes, for example. And we have maybe last phase transformation during this mesh manufacturing pro uh, process regarding the surface and the interface. We have lower costs, faster customized production, but only the intense knowledge transfer and the interdisciplinary cooperation will lead to reliable solutions for our patients. That's why I please, please you from uh, science, from the practitioners, the manufacturers, from the technologies, let's work together and uh, let's see how we can improve these new technology. And uh, you can contact me for that also at any time. And my conclusion concerning ceramic dental implants, on the other hand, they are today already a serious factor in dental implant geology. In addition to titanium, the request is increasing and the outcome is comparable to titanium. We don't want to replace titanium implants. We have not to be fanatic, but we have indications with um, the clinical advantages which we can use, for example. And uh, we have also here to solve some questions uh, concerning the biomaterial and the clinical approach. And for that, we need really a scientific and uh, evidence-based and serious approach. And this is a task, and this was a reason for the European Society for Ceramic Implantology. As an European network in a community for research, and on the other hand, the clinical approach, we bring all together on a science and evidence-based professional base. We are independent, neutral, 
and we are really focused on the research and especially in the education in the ceramic implantology because it's very important to, to train and educate how to use these kind of implants. And um, yeah, you know, every one of you or most of you know these really famous guys from the biomaterial, Jerome Chevalier, Professor Ralph Kohal, Corrado Picconi, for example, in our scientific advisory board and a lot of more. And the board of directors, was, uh, you've seen a lot of studies from Stefan Rölig today, our vice president in this lecture today, but also supported by our company partners. And this is not a financial support, it's really a cooperation and a working together to improve these kind of implants. And we really built it up a community with our members from all over the world and especially from Europe, certainly. And I only, and I can invite you, John Ceramic, um, become also a member of this community in this group of the SD visitors on SD online. And uh, yeah, thank you to Litos. Thank you for your attention. And um, now I'm open for every question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jens, uh, for this very interesting presentation and uh, yeah, sharing your expertise with us today. Um, so yes, if you have any questions for Dr. Taj, please feel free to get in, in contact with him. And um, yes, I think we are um, at the end of our uh, today's session. So thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Jens, and all our thank viewers you. for this great session. Have a nice day and hope to catch up with you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you to all. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, everyone who listens. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.